uh, Foundations of Catholic Social Teaching, Ave Maria Press. That's the second semester book. Um, and I haven't found a free online version of it. They do, you can get the first chapter if you just search it. Um, and you can get the first chapter for free, but we'll start by using this, the first semester book. So if you haven't gotten the second semester one, um, you still have time. Um, make sure to log your attendance on Schoology with that, um, well, that's the agenda, with the link. And our agenda for today, um, we'll pray and we're gonna do the Epiphany House Blessing. And I put the link here if you guys would like to bless your houses at home. Um, then we have a little lecture on, we're going to start kind of slow with the intellectual virtues. Um, and then I'll, at the end of class, we'll, we'll end before the time of the class is out. So you'll have time to do this. Um, and then there's a little homework assignment. And it's, it's simply, um, did I put due to Schoology there? Hang on. It's not due to Schoology. I don't know why I put that. Maybe I was thinking of my freshman homework. Um, just read 114 through 115 and 117 through 118 and skim 118 through 120 of um, chapter eight in the green book. And it's on, um, <clears throat> it starts to introduce Catholic social teaching, and it's on the commandment not to steal. And um, we'll review it in class next time. There's You don't have to submit anything, um, but do be ready to kind of review it and discuss it next class. So um, that's the homework in the agenda. So let's go ahead and go. Is there anything else? I think that's good. Um, get started. So, and I showed you, I always put the slides online for you guys in case you want them. So this is the introduction to the semester. And we'll also talk about the intellectual virtues. So for prayer, um, I have the Epiphany house blessing and I got to fix something. There's a mistake here. I didn't notice it when I first downloaded this graphic, but here it should be two zero. So some of you and some of you might already you know, I want to put this away for a second. Um, some of you might already do this, um, but the Ep Epiphany House Blessing, Epiphany is a feast that we celebrated on Sunday, and it honors the time when the three wise men brought the gifts to Jesus. And so um, it's and it also usually coincides with the beginning of the secular year. So <clears throat> Uh, it's a good time to bless your house for the new year. So um, the way um, some Catholics do this is by um, reciting prayers and then over your door putting these initials. So you have the numerals, so 20 and then 20, 21, 20 and then 21. So that's the year 2021. And then in between the initials, you put crosses for Christ and you put the letter C M B, and that has kind of two meanings. It stands for Caspar, Melchior, and Balthazar, the traditional names of the three wise men, or this Latin phrase, and I'm not going to try to pronounce it. I tried with the first period, but I never took Latin, so I'll probably mess it up. Um, but it means, may Christ bless this house. And so um, if you take, a, this link is in the agenda, and it's also here. Um, I got the prayer this time from the, the order of the Carmelites and, um, this is how you do it and you do it with chalk. It's also called chalking the door. Um, cause obviously it'll change every year and you don't want to damage your property. So you put 20 and then 21 and I put crosses in between all of them and then CMB and this explains it. It also, um, gives you prayers, a scripture reading um, different ways you can write it and um, uh, an additional prayer for the pandemic. But um, for me, it was really kind of cathartic because um, the other night when I went out, uh, I already had this written over my door and I just 
erase the the zero for 20 and put in the one for 21. And it was like, it was like, I got to erase the, the 2020 and it was very, um, like I said, cathartic. Like I got to, like, I'm erasing 2020. It was a dumpster fire of a year. And I put 2021 up and then said the prayer and it was like, almost like, um, uh, like a therapy or something. So I wanted to share that with you guys. Let me do this and go back. So, um, obviously if you want to do it, ask your parents first. And again, you use chalk, um, because you don't want to damage your property permanently. So, um, this is, uh, the, um, prayer in particular for right now, the pandemic, but as we prepare to pray, um, if you have any special intentions, you can put them in the chat. Um, so in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Um, as we gather for prayer, I'd just like to say a special intention for um, a smooth and peaceful transition of power from the Trump administration to the Biden administration. I want to pray Thanksgiving for all the scientists um, who developed the vaccine and that the healthcare organizations and our government leaders will be able to um, provide the vaccine fairly and swiftly. Um, any other special intentions? You could put them in the chat. Emily for her sister. Um, um, come on, what's your first name? Is it Alex? I can't remember. For um, your uncle, for Jana's friend's dad, Carmen, a situation, Kendall, her stepmom, Mimi, friends and family, anybody else? Emma's mom. Yeah. Oh, good. It's Alex. Yeah. No, it's okay. That's okay. I just, I was trying to re remember like your first name off the top of my head. Um, yeah, I, I never had a problem memorizing students' names before I had kids, but there's something about having babies that almost it, it makes you stupid or something like after having kids and returning to work like it's almost like I have face blindness I have the hardest time remembering people's names and and it's it's sad because I think sometimes students take it personally like why don't you know my name and it has nothing to do with you guys it's just me um and it, it I always feels so bad um thank you so here's our prayer May the peace of Christ be with all who enter this house, your homes, and our home at St. Francis. Watch over and protect our families and loved ones in these difficult times of the pandemic. Keep us from sickness, danger, and restore health to those who've contracted the virus. May we be signs of your healing presence to one another um, as we welcome you, Savior of us are, all into our hearts and homes. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay. Um, oh, I forgot to put this in the pair deck. Well, how about in the chat? Clear. In the chat. So we celebrate the Feast of the Epiphany on Sunday. And that's when the wise men bring the gifts to Jesus. And, um, uh, and some of you have already reflected upon this in your writing, but 2020 was a difficult year. But it also brought us unexpected gifts. So rather than um, start the new year on a negative note, I thought we'd start the new year on a positive note and reflect on what are some of the unexpected gifts that we got in 2020. We had a lot of struggles, um, but they're unexpected gifts. And the one I would share is um, my family, we had to super... At we all of us have been going through quarantines, but right in the middle of November, um, my daughter's school sent a note home saying that she had been exposed to COVID at her school. And so I called St. Francis and they said, well, then you have to quarantine too. So my family was like in quarantine starting even before Thanksgiving. And then I wanted to go back to work on campus at, um, St. Francis. So I got the COVID test and my test came back positive. 
And then, um, of course, I got my kids tested. Their tests came back positive. So we are an example of people who get COVID and don't know it. Um, so then we really had to hunker down and quarantine. Um, and uh, one of the unexpected blessings is my, I think I've showed you the picture of my daughter's little orange cat. Um, we've never spent so much time at home with this cat. And, and we live in a very small two bedroom apartment. and. Um, we've just noticed how beautiful she is. And like one, like we keep, she, I don't know if, if you have cats, um, I don't know if male cats have this, but female cats kind of have a saggy tummy that hangs down. And um, like when she runs, it kind of shakes side to side. And she's not a fat cat. She's a thin cat. Um, but we started calling it her fluff sack because her tummy is all fluffy. And um, the other day, my daughter was like, why do we keep talking about how fluffy Sally is? Because we never talked about it before. And I think it was because we were kind of all stuck together. We started noticing things about the cat that we never had before, especially how beautiful she is and how she has this fluffy tummy. And it's like, um, we just like, we didn't notice it because we hadn't been stuck in the house with her like that ever before. Um, so for me, an unexpected blessing was um, enjoying the beauty of this little cat. And it's very simple, but... Um, it's brought so much joy to, to be like, when you think about being stuck in a house, it's, it's tough. We don't even live in a house. We live in a really small apartment, but being able to enjoy the cat has been an unexpected blessing. So, um, if any of you would like to share in the chat, what are some of your unexpected gifts or unexpected blessings of 2020? I should have had like a song or something to go with this while you think about it. Emily be coming closer um, with her family. No worries. Tristan, more time with family. Yeah. Um, Kate, personal growth. Kendall, closer with family. And for you guys, that's really a, a, the biggest blessing of all. Because um, you're going to go off to college. Hopefully... Hopefully, um, now that we have the vaccine, for those of you who really want to go away for college, you'll get to do that. Um, uh, becoming super close with a couple of friends. Oh, that's beautiful. Anyone else? Unexpected gifts or blessings from 2020? go out on a positive note. Closer to family and pets plus time to do hobbies and stop uh, to take time for when high school started. Yeah, that's another thing that there's a great SNL. I don't know if you guys watch Saturday Night Live, but there's a, a great SNL sketch about how people like bought these things to do hobbies, but they didn't actually do them and need to resell them. Um, so like, check that out, but yeah, no, um, see for me, me and my husband, like we've become annoyed because people like we take our dog for a walk in the woods by our apartment. Um, and we're like, why are all these people here? It used to be so peaceful. Now everybody's out there and I'm like, get out of here. This is my woods. <laughs> but yeah, Mimi learning more about myself and opening up to a new chapter in life. Nice. Or like the whole thing with everybody learning to break, bake bread. I mentioned in the beginning like uh, that we do a Polish Christmas Eve. Um, in Polish culture, baking with yeast, like making bread is like a, it's a big thing. Everything, all the breads we eat are made with yeast uh, or and all the pastries too. And so like the fact that people didn't know how to break, bake bread to me was that like a I open her, I'm like, people don't know how to do this because I've always done it with my kids. Um, and incidentally, the whole idea of the bread, um, we make an Easter bread called Pascha, and the whole process of making the bread is like an, uh, an exercise in memorize, memory, the memory of Jesus' death and resurrection um, because like the wheat dies, like he dies and goes into the ground and it's like the the rising and then the falling of the the um, when you make bread, how it rises with the yeast, then you punch it down, 
and then it rises again. So yeah, there's a lot of symbolism there. Um, anybody else? Okay. Um, well, I hope even if you didn't put your example in the chat, um, that you're able to to find some some blessings at um, of 2020. So just announcements, um, we'll be using both textbooks. So if you haven't gotten the second semester book yet, please do. Um, grades are due Tuesday. I'll probably do mine Monday uh, because at this school, they're not due at the end of the day, they're due at noon. And I'm not gonna have time in the middle of the day to get them done. So I'll do them the night before. So check Schoology for your grades and email me with any corrections by Friday. And just to show you, um, let's see. So you have this page for this semester. If you're looking for um, courses that, that change, like first semester was one course, second semester is a different course. If you're looking for those pages, you go to courses and you go to the top right, my courses. And we have the current courses. So these are my cor current courses. And then if you go to archived, these are your first semester courses. So you would pick this and please double check your grades, especially if you turned in anything late um, uh, that I might've missed. So make sure your grades are correct. Um, there were also a few people who I don't think I had finals from. Um, so, uh, double check that. If you turned it in for some reason, I didn't get the grade. Um, just contact me by email. So this lesson um, will be on the intellectual virtues. So uh, we'll, first we'll review the organization expectations. Um, we'll identify and explain the intellectual virtues and reflect on cultivating them in our own lives. So this is the outline for this semester. We'll start unit one, methodology and major concepts. Unit two, justice in life and society. Unit three, economic justice. Unit four, solidarity and current events. And then for this semester, the final is a little project. Um, it's a newsletter, which you will do um, with a partner. So this is just a reminder of the syllabus that we went over in the beginning of last year. Tests and quizzes are 35. So for those of you who sometimes miss turning in a test and you're like, why is my grade slow? This is why it's 35% of the grade. Um, In-class work and homework, 30. Participation, 15. And then um, the social justice newsletter will be 20. Um, Grading reminders, please participate. Make sure to do any exit tickets and classwork. Make sure to arrive on time. Um, you, in the beginning, people were really good about it, but it's kind of people have slowly um, gotten kind of sloppy about coming on time. Uh, so I know I really sometimes people just forget, uh, but tr do try to be on time um, and make sure you're engaged in the Paradox. Um, and the quizzes, we'll have vocab quizzes like we did last year, and then the unit tests, which um, we were doing as take-homes. Uh, classwork and homework, make sure to pay attention to those due dates. Um, classwork is intended to be done in class, so um, you'll be given time to do that in class, and then homework is outside of class. Um, Remember, I didn't really stick to this strictly last semester, but the idea is if classwork is meant to be done in class, you need to get it in, or uh, it's 10% if late, but by the same day, 50% after it. Uh, most of you are pretty good about getting your classwork in. If you need an extension for any reason, please contact me in advance. Um, when you contact me in advance, that shows me that you're aware of what's going on, um, but you have some time, type of circumstance. When people contact me after the fact, it makes me think that you just didn't do it and now you have some kind of excuse. So it's completely understandable given the circumstances, you might not be able to get something done, but just tell me um, in advance. 
And of course, like if you're absent, you have whatever the school policy is about makeup work. Like, so for every day, class day that you're absent, you get that many days to make it up. Um, one thing we've noticed among the three senior teachers is a lot of, um, and within our classes, like plagiarism and cheating. Um, and sometimes like I'll be grading the work and I'll read something and be like, wait a minute, I've read this before. And since not everything was turned in, going through turnitin.com, I couldn't, f it was too hard for me to figure where I'd read it. Um, but in terms of the finals, or we've actually found um, some plagiarism in the finals. So it's really important. Um, we're going to be more vigilant about this. Um, and it's important to nip this in the bud because if we allow you to cheat, you're going to develop that bad habit. And later in life, it's going to have really bad consequences. I knew kids in college got kicked out for cheating. Um, when I was a grad assistant at Cal State Long Beach, I tried to have people disciplined for cheating, but my professor wouldn't support me. Um, but people lose jobs. This is really serious. Um, so we're going to try to be nipping that in the bud. Um, so please just be aware of that. If you have been doing that in the past, you got to stop it and, um, you know, reform your ways because um, high school is one thing, but in the real world, if you cheat, it does have consequences. Um, so today we're going to um, reflect on the intellectual virtues. So this is the definition of virtue from the catechism. Human virtues are firm attributes, stable dispositions, habitual perfections of the intellect, and will that govern our actions, order our passions, and guide our conduct according to reason and faith. They make possible ease, self-mastery, and joy in leading a morally good life. Um, so again, we talked about virtue a lot on and off last semester. Um, ultimately, uh, according to Aristotle and then the, the later Catholic tradition, um, what makes a human being ultimately happy, happy is living a life of virtue. And what virtue allows us to do is it allows us to experience freedom in our actions, where we do the right thing, not because we have to and not with struggle. We just do it, it with ease and it becomes natural. And that's where human beings find true joy. Um, so we talked a lot about some of the moral virtues last semester. In this semester, we wanted to introduce the idea of the intellectual virtues because we di really didn't bring them up last semester. So <clears throat> we're going to begin by watching this video. These videos are from the um, Aquinas 101 uh, and they, um, the Thomistic Institute in Washington, D.C., um, they have a school of study there, and then they produce these videos. If you were just to go to Aquinas 101, you could sign up to be part of um, Aquinas 101, and they'll just send you the videos. And the idea is, is through all the videos, it's a walk through St. Thomas's um, Summa Theologia. Uh, but this one is on the intellectual virtues. So um, I want you to watch it. It's, I'm the type of person, it's difficult for me to take notes and watch something at the same time. Um, usually I'd have to re-watch it. So just watch it, watch it, take in the information. And then after the video, I'll review the definitions with you um, to make sure you understand them. So you don't have to feel like you need to take notes um, if, if that's difficult for you to listen and take notes at the same, same time. Um, just listen, take it in, and then I'll review it after. Thomas Aquinas thinks of reason or intelligence in high and noble terms. And those terms are summed up in three intellectual virtues, understanding, knowledge, and wisdom. His explanation of these reveals the potential of the human mind to go to the height and the depth of truth. Human reason, or intellect, has a natural drive to read the world. 
people gradually come to know various things, kinds of animals, seasons of the year, mathematical truths, songs, stories, human beings, our characteristics. The list goes on and on. As we continue studying and learning the world, both individually and collectively, we learn and study increasingly more things about increasingly more subject matters, everything from grass to God. Now, the learning process is not simply learning random facts, but an attempt to understand why things are the way they are. It is one thing to know that certain birds migrate for the winter, and another thing to know why. Our awareness of reality may be distinguished roughly into things to be explained and the things that do the explaining. In the case of bird migrations, the thing to be explained is the fact that certain birds migrate for the winter, and the thing that does the explaining is the reason why they do that. For example, they're seeking a warmer climate or a better habitat for breeding or something similar. In the language of Thomas Aquinas, the things that do the explaining are called principles. When a person studies or learns a certain topic or subject matter, the person acquires an awareness of many truths. For example, someone who studies music learns all the notes on many scales and which notes form harmonious chords within different keys on the musical scale. Contained within that awareness are a great many truths about a great many notes and chords. And all those truths would seem to be a random collection unless one grasps the reason why behind chord formation. Now the quest to grasp that reason sets up the science of harmonics. Someone who knows all the truths about various chords on a musical scale, but has not yet grasped the explanation or reason why has not yet acquired understanding of harmonic principles. But when someone grasps the principle or the reason why behind the various chord formations, then the person has understanding. Speaking more generally, we can say the intellectual virtue of understanding is the fixed and stable disposition of the intellect to grasp the principle or reason why things are so in a certain subject matter, for example, in harmonics. Now, when someone has understanding of a principle in a subject matter, as in harmonics, one is in a position to look at all the truths within that subject matter in light of the principle or reason why behind them all. For example, in harmonics, one can look at all the truths about chord formations in light of the principles of proportion of sound. And when a person does so, the person sees all the many truths about various chords fall into an orderly whole, an intelligible pattern, and that orderly whole of many truths is called knowledge or science. The intellectual virtue of knowledge or science is the fixed and stable disposition of the intellect to see a multiplicity of truths in a certain subject matter as an orderly whole in light of a first principle. Both understanding and knowledge are acquired by studying things and often over a long period of time and addressing many questions. The difference between understanding and knowledge is this. Understanding is of a principle or reason why within a subject matter. Knowledge is of all the truths within a subject matter in light of the principles. Understanding of principles orders and provides explanation within whole branches of knowledge or fields of science. Newton's three laws and various other principles, for example, reveal the order and provide an explanation for all the truths within the branch of knowledge or science called classical mechanics. Now, there's one last intellectual virtue to consider. If someone can grasp a principle within a specific subject matter or domain, such as bird migration or harmonics or classical mechanics, and by grasping that principle, see the explanatory order of that whole domain of truths and arrive at knowledge or science, what would happen if we expanded our subject matter or domain of truths as far as possible? What if we asked about reality as a whole? Can we grasp 
the first principle or explanatory factor of reality as a whole? If one were to do so, then one would have the intellectual virtue of wisdom. The intellectual virtue of wisdom is the fixed and stable disposition of the intellect by which one glimpses the first principle of reality as a whole. The ancient philosopher Aristotle thought that it was metaphysics that did just that, and he called it wisdom. Now, metaphysics does indeed catch a glimpse of the first principle of reality and knows that the first principle of all things is God. But thanks to God's own revelation of himself and our response of faith seeking understanding of what God has revealed, theology knows God far better than metaphysics. And that is why theology is traditionally called a higher wisdom. Theology knows God revealing himself and all things in his light. Okay, so let me uh, just review that. Okay. So the three intellectual virtues that Father articulated were um, understanding, knowledge, and wisdom. So one of the things that's unique about human, human beings is we have the intellect or human reason, which is a power of our soul. And it helps us read the world um, and not just know random facts. Like I can know the you know, Pythagorean theorem, but to actually understand the why of those things. And that really makes us different from other animals, even higher order animals like um, the chimpanzees, you know, uh, or even like my dog, like my dog, um, she knows stuff. She has a memory, but she never asked the why. Like she obviously loves me and is devoted to me, but the dog never wonders why. Um, and so this is something unique to human beings in the way we can understand our reality. Um, so the first of the intellectual virtues, and actually I think I'll type this because the pen hasn't been working very well, but um, the first is understanding. Um, and this is the stable disposition um, of the intellect. Uh, to grasp um, principles, principles, and um, in other words, um, principles are why things are the way they are. So they're they have explanatory power. Um, so understanding is kind of the the lowest level um and with all wait what oh is it not spell checking this in who knows how much of this is misspelled um so we start with understanding so um for ex well so for example let's give an example for example um knowing um, uh, there's about knowing that birds migrate, um, and, uh, plus knowing, knowing the why birds migrate. So it goes beyond just knowing simple facts, but knowing the why, which is the principle. Um, so next we had, uh, knowledge. So let me do that in different colors of blue. Knowledge. So, what, sorry. Ah! So knowledge, it starts with that same phrase, the stable disposition of the intellect, because that's what habits are. They're stable dispositions. So the stable disposition of the intellect to, to see many truths um, in a subject 
matter in an orderly an orderly whole in light of a first principle. Um, we become aware of the principles with understanding and then we understand them on a larger dimension with knowledge. So an example might be, uh, at Father gave the example of knowing, um, knowing Newton's uh, laws. Um, plus, you know, other truths of Newtonian physics, which um, would order all the truths of classical mechanics. So, hang on, let me try to fix that. Mechanics. Um, so, I'm not sure if it, Uh, I don't know. I don't know about the spelling. Usually I use spell check. But again, the idea here is not just knowing a collections of truth and the principles behind them, but being able to draw them together into an orderly whole. And then finally, the last um, in the highest level of intellectual virtue would be um, wisdom. So wisdom is that stable and fixed definition, uh, stable and fixed disposition of the intellect by which one um, glimpses, well, I don't know if that's spelled right, glimpses uh, the first principle The first principle of reality as a whole. Um, and so if we have individual areas of expertise, physics, harmonics, um, biology, chemistry, mathematics, literature, uh, all these different areas, what is holding these all together, it's the first principle of reality as a whole. Now, Aristotle, Aristotle, Aristotle said metaphysics, which you can study in college if you take philosophy, was the how we understand reality as a whole. Um, but ultimately, God um, is the first principle of all things. First principle of all things. Um, and he reveals himself through um, scripture and tradition. So if you want to go to the highest pinnacle of knowledge, um, one ought to study theology. Because ultimately, if you want to understand, because think about it. Our universe is knowable. We have laws of nature. We have laws of gravity. We have, um, you know, laws of how to write a perfect paragraph. That begs the question, what is holding all these laws, all this, this um, order in existence? There has to be something outside of it, an ordering principle that's ordering everything we can understand. And that ordering principle is God himself. Because um, honestly, if the universe is just completely and totally random, you can't do science because you couldn't like take Newtonian physics, like the laws of gravity. If there is no ordering principle to the universe, then there's no way you could assume that when you drop an apple one day, it would fall to the ground. What if, the, you know, the next day, what if it flies through the air? But that's not the way the world works. The world has governing order. And the only way you have order is through 
someone who gives it order. The mind of God is what orders everything we know. And so this is where the intellectual virtues come into play. They help us to have um, the stable disposition to understand the, the governing order of the universe, both in um, kind of smaller ways by just say, understanding a subject matter like harmonics or Newtonian physics, and then in bigger ways to actually understand the ordering principle of the universe, which is what we call God. Um, so those are the intellectual virtues um, kind of writ large. Now um, we're gonna, we have an assignment for you guys to look at um, other sub virtues that help you to master the intellectual virtues. So let me save this and then go to the next slide. For readings, podcasts, okay. and more videos like this, go to Other, Oh, I got to get out full screen. Aquinas101.com. While you're there, be sure, yeah, what? be sure to sign up for one of our free video courses on Aquinas. Oh, here we go. <laughs> okay. So Thomas Aquinas yeah. thinks of reason or in All right. So um the intellectual virtues like all virtues are have this in particular with these are habitual dispositions of the mind. So they're acquired and they take practice. So the um oftentimes the virtues are um the analogy is either with like sports or with learning like a language or music that you have to keep practicing to actually gain the virtues. Um, but unlike other things like a sport or music, they're not just skills, they're actually, they become character traits. So the degree to which you master a virtue or succumb to a vice kind of defines who you are. And so those who've mastered the intellectual virtues like understanding knowledge and wisdom become people of understanding knowledge and wisdom. Um, so they're, they become part of who we are as people. They're not just skills that we have. Um, they also have a moral quality because they involve our values, motivations, and intentions. And very often we see this in, in so far as we actually um, value the virtues and want to master them. And so the virtues are always, what whatever virtue it is, even an intellectual, intellectual virtue is always connected um, to morality. Because remember morality, any, uh, morality is always about what we ought to do. So in terms of the intellectual virtues, if someone decides they ought to master the virtue of understanding or knowledge or wisdom, that's a moral decision. Um, and those who choose not to, that's also a moral decision, um, but a poor one. Um, they're aimed at cognitive goods. So some of the other virtues we looked at, the virtue I use as an example a lot was temperance, because it's something that most people understand and struggle with. So temp the virtue of temperance has to do with having um, freedom and moderation um, to pursue our uh, bodily passions or bodily appetites. So things like our desire for like food and sex. And so um, I gave you guys last semester the example of the tiramisu cakes. When I moved up here to Sacramento, um, I started shopping at Safeway and they have this in the um, bread part of the bakery part of the store, these tiramisu cakes, and they have the big ones you could buy or little slices. And I got into the habit um, of eating those tiramisu cakes. And um, I developed the vice of gluttony where I was um, eating the tiramisu cakes, not because I was really enjoying them, just because. Um, and actually over the past year, I mastered the virtue of temperance um, in the face of the tiramisu cake, uh, last week, my husband, uh, my daughter wanted a piece of cake, but they didn't have the single pieces. And so he bought the whole long piece of cake and it was in the refrigerator. And I managed to um, have one slice, really enjoyed it. And it sat in the fridge and I didn't 
eat all of it. I didn't, yeah, I didn't even want it. I was like, I have my one piece. I'm good. And that's what virtue is all about. It's about freedom. I was no longer a slave to my desire for the tiramisu cake. But in this regard, they're cognitive goods, not like a bodily good, like temperance. Um, and the, all of the virtues are a balance of two extremes. So if you have um, a, a, like a continuum here, this would be too much. This would be too little. Virtues are always the mean. So M E A N. Okay, so the virtues are always the mean between two extremes of too much or too little. So with the virtue of temperance, temperance is having a balance between um, desiring a bodily good too much or too little. So someone who desires it too much would be like someone who's like a glutton and, and just eats or drinks or has sex for the purpose of it, not really... Um, to enjoy it, it's they become a slave to their appetites. Um, but too little, this would be someone who's too scrupulous and say, um, say you have a person who, like if you use the example of alcohol, um, being able to sit down at supper and enjoy a good glass of wine and have the one glass of wine and be satisfied, not desire more, the glutton would just want more and more and get drunk. Whereas someone who would be on the opposite end um, might be um, like, well, I can't have any wine. You know, I'm not going to have any, uh, or somebody who might be like an ascetic would say, well, I'm not going to eat anything or I'm only going to eat rice. Like that's taking it to the opposite, opposite of extreme. Virtues are about having a balance in between the two. Okay. Whoops. So, for our assignment for today, um, there's a link here, and it's also going to be in your assignment. We find we found these um, nine virtues of a good thinker. So these are nine kind of sub virtues that will help you master um, the three uh, prime virtues of intellect: understanding, knowledge, and wisdom. So they divided this up into three categories. Um, virtues that will get you starting on the path to knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, virtues that help you execute well, and then handling challenges, which I've mentioned this before. I, I think, I know I talk about it with the freshmen. I think I've talked about it with you guys too. This would be what we call today the idea of the growth mindset. The idea that when you um, are presented with a challenge, um, you don't see it as like a bad thing. You see it as an opportunity for growth. So for getting started, um, and these are like the slogans for each, is the virtue of curiosity. So curiosity is a disposition to wonder, ponder, and ask why. It's a thirst for understanding and a desire to explore. So this is what starts us getting to the virtue of understanding. And the slogan would be to ask questions, to be curious, to wonder why, like not just be like, oh, it's great that the light switch works when I turn it on, but to ask, hey, how does that work? You know, why does that work that way? Um, next should be intellectual humility. Um, this is a willingness to own up to one's own intellectual limitations and mistakes, an ability to think and reason for oneself. Wait, well, sorry, um, unconcerned with intellectual status or prestige, the slogan would be admit what you don't know. And I know this is one I definitely struggle with. Um, one of the vices that I struggle with is pride. Um, but intellectual humility is about being able to admit that we, we don't know everything. And I've seen a lot of you do this in your writing, like um, with the finals and stuff. Some people would say, you know what? I just don't really have an opinion about this because it's not something I'm really interested in. And that's a good thing, being able to admit what you don't know. Next is intellectual autonomy. Um, this is the capacity for active self-directed thinking and ability to think and reason for oneself. And then the slogan here would be think, think for oneself. So um, often today people, um, if you've ever heard the expression like we're tribal or we're partisan, um, people often think in terms of, it, it, it kind of depends on the situation, but like well, this is what my political party says, so this is what I think. Or this is what, you know, the Catholic Church says, so this is what I think. Intellectual autonomy is about being able to come to your own understanding. 
um, and to be independent of like kind of a tribal mentality. So to think for yourself, that's another important skill. Executing well is about, um, this gets you started. And this um, is about uh, being able to, to execute well those intellectual virtues of understanding, wisdom, and knowledge. So first is attentiveness, a readiness to be personally present in the learning process, uh, keeps distractions at bay and, and strives to be a mi mindful and engaged. So the slogan here will be look and listen. So I think for a lot of you guys, this might be a virtue that you'll wanna work on um, this semester because online learning, it's really hard to have that attentiveness. I've taken online classes myself. I also have ADD. So um, in the past, I know for myself, um, I remember one time I was taking an, an online class, it was asynchronous. So it meant that I was learning at my own pace. But I remember I was recovering from foot surgery and I turned on my online video. And while the video was playing, I was on my phone looking at Facebook. So I was definitely um, not practicing that virtue. So um, for some of you, maybe this is something you wanna focus on to really be present to each of your classes when we're online or in the classroom. Um, next, intellectual carefulness. This is a disposition to notice and avoid intellectual pitfalls and mistakes. It strives for accuracy. So the slogan here is avoid errors. And this doesn't just mean errors in terms of like spelling and things like that. It also means to try to avoid intellectual errors like logical fallacies um, and things like that. Uh, intellectual thoroughness. This is uh, a disposition to seek and provide expl explanations. Unsatisfied with mere appearances or easy answers, probes for deeper meaning and understanding. Um, the slogan would be go deep. So this is where we're not just fat satisfied with understanding. We want to go to those deeper levers of, of, of uh, knowledge and wisdom. Um, and I know my, my sister was in the military. So the fr phrase we used a lot in our family was attention to detail. And sometimes you'll see that in your, in your rubrics and comments on your work. The idea of having this attention to detail and really taking pride in your work and also trying to go to deeper levels of understanding. And finally, we have handling challenges, which I would call the growth mindset. Um, so first is open-mindedness. Open an ability to think outside the box is a fair and honest hearing to competing perspectives. So being able to not just um, kind of toe the party line, but also listen to the views of others. Um, I always encourage you guys to listen to the teaching of the church, but also, um, you know, come at it from your own perspectives. Um, and this would be uh, thinking outside the box, not only in terms of listening to different perspectives, but also looking for different solutions. So, um, oftentimes people, especially like in uh, the subjects we're doing, moral theology and social justice, they think there's only one answer to the question, but be open-minded. Maybe there's more than one way to solve a problem. Um, intellectual courage. This is a readiness uh, to persist in thinking or communicating in face of fear, including fear of embarrassment or failure. So the slogan is take risks. So with this one, um, uh, and some of you talked about this in your um, reflections on Humana Vitae. I know um, somebody had mentioned that um, for Catholics who are committed to the principles of Humana Vitae, it can be scary because what the church teaches is very different from what the world teaches. And the student in her writing reflected on how um, the church can provide support for couples who want to live that virtue. Um, and so, again, this idea that, especially in terms of what the church teaches, what the church teaches is very different from what the world teaches. And it takes courage to stand up for her values. Um, so having the courage to be able even if you're the only person in the room that believes whatever, being able to articulate your views um, in despite of fear. And finally, insulin, intellectual tenacity, a willingness to embrace intellectual challenge and struggle keeps its eye on the prize and doesn't give up. Embrace the struggle or um, maybe like eye of the tiger. So being able to, um, even when you're challenged, to be able to continue to, um, face that struggle. And, you know, it could be all kinds of different situations, but 
um, when you're faced with intellectual struggles to not give up, but to continue the journey. Um, I remember when I took, uh, when I was in high school, I got a, a D in my um, trig class. And so when I was accepted to USC, they sent me a, a letter along with my acceptance saying, uh, by the way, if you don't get a C in your math class, your acceptance is revoked. And so at the time I had a D, I had just gotten a new math teacher because the first math teacher was so bad, they had a fire in. And um, so I would uh, go in at lunch or after school, but when I had track, I would go in at lunch because I couldn't come after school. But um, I would tutor every day with my math teacher and I, even though it was hard and I had to dig myself out of a hole, I had to bring that grade up so I could get into college. Um, so that's the idea of intellectual tenacity, not being afraid of a challenge and being able to keep going. So um, the assignment we have for you, uh, let me take a sip of my pop. Um, and this is on Schoology. Actually, as a matter of fact, if I click this link, I think it'll take me there. Oh my goodness, it's 12.30 already, gee whiz. Um, so in the next 10 minutes, what you're going to do um, is there's a link to the article, and I basically already verbally went over everything right now. Look at these guys, they I got their turn in. Um, is um, given those nine intellectual virtues, on a piece of paper, so you take a picture or on a Google Doc, do the following. For each of the three sections, choose one of the three virtues you think you need the most growth in inquiring at the moment. Um, and for each, respond to the following. What is it? The name of the virtue? Why? Why you identify it as something to work on? How? How you can work on it? Um, and then upload this to Schoology by the end of the day. Um, and again, I just went through them all for your reference there um, here, uh, but one for each category and then answer these questions and put it on Power School. And then remember to review chapter eight before next class. Um, but that's all I have for today. So you, it's, I think we get out 1240. So you still got a little less than 10 minutes to do that. Um, class assignment, but it's super simple. So you should probably be able to get it done. Any questions? No? All right, then. Well, I'm happy to see you. Happy New Year. And I'll see you next class. Bye. Have a good day.